Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at part three of our Basics of EKG series, where we go over the basics of reading an EKG perioperatively and how to deal with certain issues that may arise intraoperatively. Before I get started with this, I do want to preface it with, I am not a cardiologist. This is meant to be a rudimentary explanation of looking at an EKG and being able to recognize when something isn't right so that you can bring it to the attention of the appropriate individual or treat it if it's something within your purview within the operating room or perioperatively. So let's get started. You can see I've drawn my sample EKG pattern here labeled with different parts of it. Our P wave representing atrial depolarization our PR interval, which represents the conduction time of the signal from the atria to the AV node and ventricles, the QRS complex, representative of the ventricular depolarization, the ST segment, in which the ventricle is contracting, the T wave, which is the cardiac tissue repolarization, and the QTC, which is ventricular depolarization and repolarization. Each of these will be addressed over the next 10 minutes. So the first thing I look at when I'm reading an EKG is the rate and a normal rate is going to be recorded as 60 to 100 beats per minute. It's important to note that as you move towards the ends of normal either 60 or 100 you're bordering on pathologic and you should use your clinical judgment if there's an issue. I bring this up because 100 may be considered the normal range but I don't know about you if my heart was beating 100 times a minute it probably wouldn't be normal. There are a couple ways to look at this in order to calculate it quickly. You can multiply the number of R peaks by 10, as many EKG strips are six seconds, and that would give you per minute. Or you can divide 300 by the number of large boxes between the RR intervals. Those are just two quick and dirty ways. If you really want, you can just look at what the EKG says. The next thing I look at is the rhythm. Now, when I think of rhythm, I separate it into two parts. There is the actual P, Q, R, S, T structure as a whole, and how often that whole structure is coming, or on what interval. So, for example, a normal sinus rhythm is a regularly regular rhythm, in that the entire complex itself is regular in its morphology, and it's coming at a regular interval, every, say, 10 seconds. But we have variations. AFib, for example, is an irregularly irregular waveform because its morphology is irregular and it comes at erratic timing. But then you have things like Wenckebach, which I see as being regularly irregular. While the P Q or S T complex is irregular because the PR continues to widen and then it drops, the pattern itself, as in the interval on in which this pattern is occurring, is a regular pattern. The next thing I look at is if it's sinus. And many cardiologists will combine sinus and rhythm. I look at them separately. Sinus for me is whether or not the rhythm is originating at the SA node and would be delineated by an upright P wave and only a single P wave coming for each QRS complex. Next is axis, as I promised from the first video. And we're going to look at leads AVF and lead 1 to determine our axis. This is a quick and dirty way, but as we mentioned in video one, lead one has no Y component and lead AVF has no X component. As a result, if an EKG is positive in lead one and positive in AVF, then we know the vector of the heart must also have an X component going to the left and a Y component going down. This would mean that there would be a normal axis going in this overall direction. A left axis deviation, for example, would have a positive deflection in lead one, but a negative deflection in lead AVF. Five is going to be my PR interval. Now a normal PR interval is three to five little boxes. In actual technical terms, it's going to be 0.12 to 0.2 seconds where each little box is representative of 0.4 seconds. Prolonged or abnormal or changing PR intervals are a cause of concern as they can be indicative of a worsening heart block, which may need to be addressed with a pacemaker or something prior to proceeding with surgery. 
So it's important that you recognize these prior to going to the operating room. Next, I look at the QRS complex, mainly at its width. A normal QRS complex is less than three little boxes. Sorry. Or it's less than 0.12 seconds. Wide QRS complexes may be indicative of various pathologies, such as perioperative electrolyte abnormalities that can have intraoperative repercussions and should be addressed prior going to the operating room. Seven, for me, is the ST segment. And obviously here we'll be looking for depressions and elevations. I hope everyone at this point who's watching this knows that major ST changes uh, would be indicative of acute coronary syndrome of some sort and should be addressed as soon as possible. T waves should be up, up and rounded, but not peaked and not tented or inverted, as these can all be indicative of electrolyte abnormalities or nonspecific ischemic changes that, again, need to be addressed sometimes by cardiology prior to surgery or corrected with some type of uh, electrolyte infusion. Finally, I look at the QTC, which you can find as a reading at the top of the EKG, and it's a corrected or normalized QT segment length corrected to 60 beats per minute. Now, a normal QTC is 450 to 470, roughly. And this has implications surrounding it, things like perioperative pharmacology and use of certain drugs, which can prolong the QTC, such as methadone or antipsychotics or certain antiemetics, which could then potentially throw the patient into a torsades de quant. Next, I want to mention certain things you may see intraoperatively. Uh, the first being premature ventricular complexes, or PVCs. PVCs. And these are electrical impulses that begin in the ventricles and can disrupt the normal electrical signal of the heart. They sometimes are the result of electrolyte abnormalities, volume issues, or sometimes just inherent arrhythmias of the heart. A differential should be established as to why you're getting them and proper treatment, sometimes involving increase in fluid rates, calcium for cardiac membrane stabilization, or sometimes antiarrhythmic agents such as lidocaine may be used to help deal with them. At baseline, they're not pathologic in a sense that every once in a while they won't harm the patient, but when they start coming at regular intervals should be about a time when you should start dealing with them or they should start concerning you. Demand ischemia, demand ischemia, is something that may come up and can demonstrate itself as T wave or ST segment changes. Cardiac oxygen demand is a function of three things, wall tension, contractility, and heart rate, with heart rate being the most important. As such, during parts of surgery when the patient's heart rate increases, as in response to pain or laryngoscopy, they may exhibit EKG changes as a result of the increased oxygen demand and inability to meet it. In these cases, we should look to ensure that our patient is hemodynamically stable, and if they are, look to lower the oxygen demand, usually by decreasing the heart rate. If they aren't stable, it's important to notify the surgeon, stop surgery if you must, and decide whether or not cardiology has to become involved. Now, the last thing that I want to touch on that you will see on your exams at some point, especially in anesthesia, is which leads are sensitive and specific for ischemia. V5 alone will detect 75% ischemia or ischemic incidences. If you add V4, this increases to 90%. And if you then add lead 2, as in we're going to use all three of these, then you get 96% detection of ischemia. Again, I promise this will come up on your exams, be it your ITE, your boards, or your AKTs. So that concludes the basics of our EKG. Check in later for another intra-op EKG video. As always, if you have any questions or topics you would like covered, please write to us. Otherwise, check in for our next video.